public worship of God, singing to his praise in Psalm 29. We're going to commence our singing at verse 4. We'll sing from 4 down to the end of the psalm. And uh, in these verses, the, the emphasis, in fact, the emphasis begins earlier than that, um, is on God's voice. In verse 4, we're told that it's a powerful voice and that it's a voice of majesty. In verse 5, we're told that it's a voice that is able to uh, tear up the cedars and um, uh, to produce all manner of remarkable effects over creation uh, and so on down through the verses, the voice of God in all its power. Singing from verse 4, a powerful voice. A powerful voice it is
Can we unite in prayer? Let us pray together. A powerful voice it is that comes out from the Lord Most High. What a powerful voice the voice of God is. The voice that spoke and created. Let there be light and there was light. And let the seas bring forth life and they brought forth life. Let us make man in our image. And man is made in the image of God. The power of that powerful voice. O oh Lord, we bow tonight in the presence of the one whose voice it is. And we pray, O oh Lord, this evening for help as we come. The leading of God's Spirit in such a way that distractions and other thoughts are kept away from our minds and we are led into worship that we will go away feeling we have been in worship, that we will go away aware of the fact that what we have engaged in tonight is different to everything else we engage in in life, that this is a holy moment, a solemn, serious moment in the presence of God, and that this is a great opportunity a great opportunity to hear the word, to consider God's word, to consider our own standing before God, an opportunity that many are denied. O oh Lord, our God, we give thanks that we are here this evening. We give thanks that despite the inclemency which inevitably has kept some back, we have been able to be here. Our ah, Lord, that we would count it a pressure and a blessing and a joy to be here. I joyed when to the house of God go up, they said to me. Forgive us for our dullness, our slowness to appreciate these blessings. Forgive us for how blunt spiritually we are, for how low our spiritual appetite is, for how easily we are filled spiritually, for how easily we are distracted. O oh Lord, our oh God, we pray that our sins against God and man tonight would be forgiven for Jesus' sake, and that the blood of Christ would cover our transgressions, and that the gospel of God's grace would stir us in the presence of God. We pray, Lord, again, blessing upon each one of us. We pray for every home, every family, the young amongst us. We are so glad to have them. The elderly amongst us, we are so glad to have them. We are glad, Lord, when we see the young in God's house, their lives ahead of them. Lord, speak to them through the word and bless them in their hearts and souls and win them early for Christ. And we are glad to see those who are advanced in years in God's house. They have seen much in this world and experienced much, and yet this is where they wish to be. For everything they have seen has shown them the frailty of this world and the need of the Lord. Send more, O Lord, we pray from the homes around us and the villages around us. Touch hearts and lives that are prayerless and churchless and thoughtless and careless and Christless. O oh Lord, we pray that thy hand would work, would work in homes that perhaps we visit and encourage. And yet we are disappointed at the poor response and others that perhaps we come into contact with and we feel that we make no progress at all in our contact with them. Others that perhaps we speak a word to 
and we wonder if our words have any effect on them. Oh Lord, we pray for the power of God's Spirit. That is what we need and that is what we lack. And we feel its absence keenly, but perhaps not keenly enough. Make us feel it more keenly. May it be more of a concern to us how things are. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon those of our families who are away, uh, away from home, at work, or study. We pray, Lord, for them. We pray for others who will be returning even this coming week. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon those who are far away with work, on land and even on sea. Watch over them, O Lord, and grant that their thoughts will turn to the one who made the sea and the dry land. We pray, Lord, thy blessing upon all who are unwell. We know that and, and some of our number are absent with ill health. We pray, Lord, for each one of them and pray that they might know thy help in their weakness and in their questions and in their discouragements. And when the body is weak and when the mind is weak, it is hard to look up and be positive, but grant that they would find grace to be positive in the Lord, to be strong in the Lord even when everything else feels weak. We pray thy blessing, eternal one, upon those who are struggling with long-term ill health and who week by week are unable to be in the house of God. O oh Lord, we pray for them. And we pray especially for thy people in these situations that they might know the Lord blessing them in spite of outward circumstances and that indeed they would feel that the Lord was using the outward circumstances to be a means of blessing for them. We pray, eternal one, for again for the work of the denomination. We remember all our congregations at home and abroad. We think of the work in Sri Lanka, in France, Spain, and Portugal. We pray for our friends across the Atlantic, in Canada and in the United States. We pray for our seminary and the students. We pray for our publishing work and the magazines and the internet. We pray, Lord, for uh, the... Uh, the wider work of the gospel and other organizations that we support in different ways. Pray for the work of the Trinitarian Bible Society. Raise up others who will be able to translate into new languages and open doors of opportunity eh, for the spread of God's word. We pray for the Christian Institute as it raises moral and ethical issues week in and week out. Can I give them wisdom, O Lord, and give them a hearing in the in the courts and in the uh, corridors of power throughout our nation. We pray, eternal Lord, for those who minister to the Jews across the world, who come to them with their Messiah. The veil is still on them, but are we pray that it would be taken away and that they would see him in his glory and in his excellence, that they would look upon him whom they have pierced. We pray, Lord, for uh, the the work of the Middle East Reformed Fellowship in different parts of the world and countless other organizations as well. We pray for the gospel in the Middle East, where it is often difficult and yet knowing blessing. We think of the nation of Iran and for the many who have turned to the Lord there and who are desperate for God's word and who are realizing that eh, eh, this is the word of God, unlike what they hold in their own hand. That nation that knew blessing in times past, the ancient land of Persia, all oh, that it would be visited again with gospel power. We pray for Iraq in its own unsettled state and the countries of North Africa, South Sudan in its permanent state of turmoil and chaos. Lord, remember thy people in these situations. Remember them under the heel of persecution. We pray for them in China, in North Korea, in Cuba in places where it is dangerous to do what we are doing tonight, in, in the areas where whole, whole, oh, even owning a copy of the Word of God is enough to see you imprisoned for years, and where opening out your mouth to support Christ is enough to bring death uh, down upon you. We pray, Lord, for, for relief for the Lord's people. We pray for the end of these totalitarian and 
brutal regimes. We pray, Lord, that they would be either changed or removed and that the cries of God's people would be heard for relief and for help. Bless, Lord, we pray thee, the nations of the world, areas of strife and areas of disaster and chaos, areas where they are hungry, areas where they are cold, areas where they, uh, they do not know where to turn. Bless the work of relief agencies such as Blythewood and other organizations who reach into hard places, not only with, uh, the, uh, the, 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 with relief and physical help, but with the love of Christ and with the gospel of God's grace. Hear our prayers, Lord. We pray that they would be received and that they and we would be cleansed as we come tonight, that our sins would be taken away and that we would have reception in the court of heaven. For Jesus' sake, amen. <clears throat> We're going to read together now in God's Word and in the Old Testament Scriptures and in the second book of Samuel and chapter 5, we return this evening to our studies in Second Samuel, having taken a little break over the holiday period. <clears throat> now, if you're able to remember back, you may recall that last time we looked at verses 1 to 9 of this chapter. We'll read these verses again and we'll read on to the end of the passage. So 2 Samuel chapter 5 from the beginning. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David to Hebron and spake saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past when Saul was king over us, how was he that led out and brought in Israel? And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel, that is, over the whole nation. All of the tribes are now united as one in desiring his kingship. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem to the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter, smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. We, I think I drew your attention last time to the fact that that is a difficult verse to, to translate. Um, the, the gutter is a reference to the, the water course by which they... Um, uh, gained access to the city and uh, where it says that David hated the lame and the blind. We we're not to uh, take that literally because obviously he didn't. We have many instances that prove that, but it's as if he's turning their own words back on them, uh, on the Jebusites, uh, and uh, bringing down upon them what they had brought upon themselves. Wherefore they said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons. And they built David a house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron, and there were yet sons and daughters born to David. And these be the names of those that were born unto him in Jerusalem, Shammuah and Shobab and Nathan and Solomon, Ibar also and Elishua and Nepheg and Japhiah 
and Elishama and Eliada and Eliphat. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed King David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hole. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thy hand. And David came to Baal Perizim. And David smote them there and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perizim. And there they, that is the Philistines, left their images or their idols, and David and his men burnt them. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until they come to Gaza. And we trust the Lord to follow with his blessing that reading of his word. We turn to sing again now in Psalm 66, and we commence our singing at verse 4. <coughs> we'll sing down to verse 12, seven stanzas. All on the earth shall worship thee, they shall thy praise proclaim in songs. They shall sing cheerfully unto thy holy name. 66 from 4, all on the earth. All on the earth shall worship thee, they shall thy praise proclaim, and songs they shall sing cheerfully. Oh, 
Well, friends, seeking the light of God's Spirit on His Word, we turn again to that second book of Samuel and that fifth chapter that we read together. And as we resume our studies in this part of God's Word, we read at verse 10, And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him, and so on. <clears throat> on the last occasion, we saw David at last crowned as king over the whole nation. For the first seven years, he was king over the tribe of Judah only and based at Hebron. But now the whole nation has united. Ishbosheth, who was the rival king, Saul's son, is now dead. There is no future in pursuing that. And so all the tribes gather under David. And then we saw last time that he makes a historic move to Jerusalem, which becomes the, cap the, the capital of the nation, a much better capital. Hebron was geographically in the wrong place, really, to be a suitable capital for the nation. Jerusalem was a much more strategic and central spot. It, how can I put it? It respected, um, um, respected isn't the word I'm trying to get to, actually. It may come back to me in a minute. But it, it recognized, maybe is a better way of putting it, the delicate balance with the northern tribes who initially were a bit wary of David's kingship. But um, a move to Jerusalem, the kingdom based in Jerusalem, would go some way to mollifying them and winning them over. Now, <clears throat> David suffered many things, of course, on his way to becoming king. Many, many trials and many, many difficulties. We were singing there in Psalm 66, the last verse we sang, he speaks of going through fire and water. And that's quite a thought, isn't it? You know, going through fire and water. You think of that, children, for instance. You know, passing through fire is probably enough, you know, and um, it would be a horrible, terrible experience. But then imagine somebody having gone through fire and having suffered maybe uh, the loss of things through fire. They're flooded. And another catastrophe has come. It's, it's the very opposite. Problems coming from one side and problems coming from another. But did you notice when we were singing what he said? That so we passed through fire and water, yet the Lord brought me to a wealthy place, to a good place. And that's what the Lord did. He passed through fire and water, but the Lord brought him to a place of blessing, just as he had promised. He had promised David at the very outset, you will be king over the nation. And it took quite a bit of time, and it took all manner of difficulties, but at last he is in that place of blessing. And verse 10 that we read a moment ago, it, it just sums it up so it's such a lovely way, doesn't it? And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. Amen and amen. Isn't that the key to it all? Faith, you see, must be tested. And the test, my Christian friend, may be hard and difficult, but the test will not last forever. There will be fire and water, perhaps, but there will also be the wealthy place at the end of it. Well, all of that brings us to this next section and to the first details that we have of David as king in Jerusalem. And in these verses, 11 down to the end, we see 
three things about David as king, or at least I want to focus on three things about David as king. And I'm going to spend almost all my time on the second one. We see, first of all, that David is a servant king. David is a servant king. Now, that may sound very strange. Servant and king isn't something you usually put together. You're either a servant or you're a king. And generally, if you're king, you're not a servant. And if you're a servant, you're not a king. But David is, in many, many ways, a servant king. Look at verse 12. David perceived or understood that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and this is a crucial bit, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people's sake. David understood that he had been made king, not for his own sake primarily, but for the sake of the people. He was there for the sake of others. And he was there ultimately to serve others. And David grasped this. And David in his best moments directed his energy and his reign towards that. Later on in chapter 9, for instance, we're going to see how he deals with Mephibosheth. Saul's grandson. And there in that passage, and in many others, we see David as the servant king. Yes, he is king. Yes, he has power. Yes, he has authority. But he's serving his people. He's not there to make himself rich. He's not there to be the big man standing over them with a whip. He's there to serve under God, the people that God had given him. He is exalted for the sake of God's people. And you know, in that little picture, we have a lovely illustration of the Lord Jesus Christ. David, in so many ways, reminds us of Jesus. And here he's reminding us of Jesus. He too is a king, the king of kings, in fact. But he is a servant king. He is king serving his people, serving his church, caring for them, carrying them with him. As he goes on, was it two weeks ago, three weeks ago today, we looked at that passage in Philippians 2. So he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He makes himself of no reputation. And he takes upon him the form of a servant. And he humbles himself for their sake. He serves for their sake. He dies for their sake. He lives, in fact, for their sake. He is our great servant king. And there is no God like this. He is unique. He is distinct. He is different to all the rest. Go across this world and find the gods of the heathen. Not one of them comes in the form of a servant king who gives himself and gives of himself for his people. All the others, they want to take, 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 take. But Christ, he is giving and giving and giving more. For he is our servant king. And David, you see, recognizes this. He's a spiritual man. The Holy Spirit is directing his thinking, directing his reign. And he understands that he was to be a humble king. To be a caring king, not a dictator, but a servant king. D.R. Davis, as he so often does, captures it well. David is over Israel for Israel. David is over Israel for Israel. 
Now, this applies in many different ways. It applies to leaders in the church, ministers, elders, whatever. They are not to be proud, egotistical, selfish, or careless. They are to be gentle. They are to be caring. They are to be self-giving. They are to put others ahead of themselves. They are to give of their time and their energy. I am among you, says Christ, as one that serveth. And there is the model for leadership in the church. And if it's a pattern for church leaders, it's a pattern for every believer. We are to give of ourselves our time, our energy, our talents, our whatever it might be in order to serve the Lord and in order to serve others. The sinful man, the unregenerate man is, is essentially selfish. It's me, myself, and my, my time, my interests, my priorities. But the gospel surely changes us. And that focus on my becomes Somebody else. Not what can I get, but what can I give? What can I do? How can I serve? Well, David is a servant king, but I must hurry. Because we notice, secondly, that David is also a successful king. He gets two things in these verses. First of all, and I'm just going to mention this. First of all, he gets help from Hiram in verse 11. Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, cedar, joiners, stonemasons. They build David a house. Hiram was a heathen king. The Lord moved him to help David. And I think we've got a little foretaste here of Christ again. The day would come when the kingdoms of this world would yield their all to Christ. And we're getting just a little glimpse of it here. So he gets help from Hiram. But secondly, and more particularly, he gets victory over the Philistines. He gets victory over the Philistines. Well, David moves to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and it's all going well. And if this was a, a fairy story written by somebody or other, they would probably say, and they all lived happily ever after. But the Bible's not like that. As I say to you so often, the Bible's not like that. Life is not like that. David is inevitably going to face challenges. Sooner or later, it's going to come. And it comes from his old enemies, the Philistines. The attack in verse 17. Why do they attack now? Why do they wait seven, eight years before they attack? Well, when David was king over the tribe of Judah with very limited authority, when he was based down there in Hebron, the Philistines didn't make any great attempt to attack him. But now, now that he has support of all the tribes, now that he is established in Jerusalem, they see him as much more dangerous, much more of a threat. As soon as the Christian church sets up in a locality, Satan attacks. You read the book of Acts, for instance. The apostles go somewhere, the gospel is blessed, a number of people are converted, Satan suddenly attacks. Again and again. Philippi, Ephesus, Corinth, Athens. Satan comes out to attack. As soon as a Christian begins to witness for Christ, Satan will attack. As soon as Christ's kingdom is set up in the heart, in the soul, in the life of a man or a woman, Satan attacks. 
While the church is doing nothing, Satan does nothing. Let sleeping dogs lie, after all. And while you are unconverted, Satan will leave you alone. He won't bother you. He has no reason to bother you. His best policy is to leave you where you are. Everything, as far as he's concerned, is going his way. He doesn't have to do anything. You are no threat to him. But once Christ becomes your king, once your king is established, he'll attack. Now, the Philistine army had several features here that I want to mention. I'm going to mention four very quickly. And it may help you younger ones if I tell you they all start with the same letter. First of all, the Philistine army was satanic. Now, I don't think you were expecting me to say that. And maybe you're saying to yourself, well, that seems a bit extreme. Why do you say it was satanic? Well, for this simple reason. That behind the Philistines was Satan. Behind the Philistines was Satan. Stirring up, emboldening them, putting thoughts, ideas, and actions into play. Satan had succeeded well with Saul. He had ruined Saul and almost ruined the kingdom. Saul, under, in the hands of Satan, had led to the weakening and the destabilizing of Israel. But now here's David, a godly man, who's going to lead the nation in a godly direction. A strong Israel, worshipping the Lord, obeying the Lord. That's the last thing Satan wanted. The last thing he wanted. Is Satan going to sit back and do nothing? Is he going to let David become stronger? Or is he going to stir things up? Is he going to move things in a frontal assault in an attempt to nip this problem in the bud? Of course he is. Behind many things in this world is the hand of Satan, more than we realize. We don't know the half of what's going on. The Bible speaks of Christ, as it were, in combat with spiritual wickedness in high places. We don't know what's going on in the spiritual realm, in the unseen realm. We don't know what Satan is moving at and working at even in national and international events, he most surely is. I don't want to say too much about it because we touched on that this morning. But it's here again. It wasn't just the Philistine army going out to battle, full stop, end of story. There was more to it than that. There always is. It was satanic. Not in the sense, perhaps, of being any more satanic than other battles and other assaults. I'm not saying that. You know what I'm saying. It was satanic. Secondly, it was strong. We're told in verse 17 that all the Philistines came up. Now, we know that there were five lords of the Philistines. We know that from other passages in the Bible. And here they've all gathered together. They've united together. The powers of darkness have a way of uniting against the Lord and 
against his work when the occasion calls for it. Don't be surprised if you see it. Don't be surprised if you see it. They're satanic. They're strong. Thirdly, they're smart. Where do they gather? Verse 18, in the valley of Rephaim. Where's the valley of Rephaim? It's a short distance from Jerusalem. You see what they're doing? We're going to get Jerusalem before David becomes strong in Jerusalem, before he's established in Jerusalem, before he's put roots down in Jerusalem, before it becomes too strong for us. Let's go straight for Jerusalem. Let's go directly to the heart of it all. And that's what Satan always does. The young Christian attacked before they become stronger in the faith, before they become more established in the truth. No sooner are they converted than Satan will come out. The Lord may give you a, a period of time in his mercy and grace, he sometimes does. But oh, the enemy will be direct to halt you in your tracks, to stop you growing in knowledge and understanding, to damage you early on. The young Christian is attacked. Or the Christian in new circumstances or in a new situation is attacked. For example, the Christian who leaves home and the safety of, of their home church. You leave home for, for work or study. Before you're established in another church, Satan will attack you. He'll try to stop you being established. He'll try to stop you becoming strong. Satan always looks for the weak spot. He'll always try to go for the bridgehead, the place that will be most the place that will be easiest and most advantageous for himself. Oh, he's smart. He's very smart. He's so smart that he'll tie you and me and he'll tie us up like that. He doesn't know everything. Only God knows everything. But he knows a lot. He knows his Bible. And he can quote it. He knows exactly what to say to you. He knows exactly where your weak point is. And he will exploit it. No wonder Christ says, tells us to pray, deliver us from evil. Oh, every day, deliver us from evil. Keep us from the ploys and the plans of Satan. Turn them upside down. Well, the Philistines, they were smart. They were strong. They were satanic but they were stopped. What the Philistines didn't know was that God was with David just as surely as he had not been with Saul. We're told in verse 21, they brought their idols to the battle, but so sudden was their defeat that they just dropped them as they ran. Or how many place their trust in things that prove useless. They carried these idols into battle and they said, well, we're sure to have success. And they placed them here and there and they would have them with them. God you have to carry about with you isn't much use, is it? We need a God who can carry us. Not a God that we have to carry. So they had a God that they had to carry. David had a God who carried him. They have a God that they have to leave behind. He has a God who leaves none of his people behind. 
Oh, how many place their trust in things that prove useless in the battles of life and in eternity. Be careful what you trust in. If it's anything other than the Lord, one day when you need it most, it'll let you down. These idols let the Philistines down. Badly. Well, the key to David's victory was, his, was David's attitude. Before the battle, he seeks God's guidance. Philistines come. He goes to the Lord. He asks in verse 19, will I go up against them? Yes, says the Lord. And then he has another question. Will you deliver them into my hand? Yes, says the Lord. He's seeking direction. He's seeking assurance. And then after the battle, what does he say? He says, the Lord did it. Verse, where are we? Verse 20. But then what happens? The Philistines come back. The Philistines come back. Verse 22. And the Philistines came up again. I don't think we were expecting that. You know, when you're reading through the passage, you expect it to end at verse 21. Verse 20. The Philistines came again. What does David do? He asks the Lord again. And what does the Lord say? He says the very opposite of what he did the first time. The first time he says to David, go up. This time he says to David, don't go up at all. This time it's not an attack. It's an ambush. He says, David, hold on. Go round behind them and wait. You know, David was tested here. He was tested in at least three things. His humility was tested. You know, David might have said, well, I did it before. I can do it again. Ah, how often we fall into that trap. I did it before. I'll manage by myself. I don't need my father's hand. I don't need my heavenly father's wisdom or power. I'm pretty good at this. I think I'll manage. Unlike the child who stubbornly refuses to hold the parent's hand, despite the fact they've taken but a few faltering steps, they shake off the hand of the parent, impatient, and they fall flat on their face. His humility was tested. The Philistines come again, and David says, Lord, I can't do this. I didn't do it the first time, and I'm not going to do it this time. It's too much for me. His humility was tested, but his obedience was also tested. The Lord says, stay where you are. Well, you know, he must have been itching to go. Can I not just go now? now? Now looks really good. Now looks really promising. David, stay. Let's see if David obeys. You know, the simple instruction is often the one that is hardest. The Lord tests, he'll test your humility. He'll bring a problem round again, a problem in which you had success before. 
and he'll see if you want to go it alone. He'll test your humility. And he'll test your obedience because you'll come up against God's word and you maybe want to do something else. And he says, no, this is my way. And he'll see what happens. But he also tested David's patience. When David inquired of the Lord, he said, verse 23, Thou shalt not go up, fetch a compass behind them, go round about them, come upon them over against the mulberry trees, and then just do nothing. And let it be when you hear the sound of a going in the tops on the mulberry trees, then you will bestir yourself. Wait there and listen. I'll give you a signal. You will hear a noise. A noise of movement in the trees. That's your signal. His patience is being tested, you see. Is he going to wait? I don't know if anybody there said to David, that's long enough, David. An awfully long time waiting. Wait, wait, wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait on his time. Wait on his way. Wait till he opens things up. Wait till you get the instruction to move on. Saul fell at all three hurdles. His humility was tested and he showed pride. His obedience was tested and he showed disobedience. His patience was tested and he was impatient. David waits and he's listening. And he hears it. The moment in the mulberry trees. It's not an ordinary sound. It's not just because the wind's picked up a bit. There's a noise in the trees. Not told exactly what it was. But it was a sign to David. The Lord's going ahead of you. You follow on. It's time to go. Time to move on. You see, David is being shown that God is not limited. We're going to sing in a moment, God's chariots, they are 20,000. God may help you in one way today, in another way tomorrow. He may surprise you in the way he brings victory. In the first Philistine attack, it's head on. In the second Philistine attack, it's hold back. All David has to do is follow on and pursue the Philistines. The Lord's gone before him. The Lord's done the great part of the work. You know, the Lord may help you more than you expect. David no doubt thought the Lord will help me in this battle. I'll go out to battle and the Lord will help me. The Lord does more than that on this occasion. The Lord's in the battle first. David is just coming behind and picking things up. Chasing the Philistines. As they run off. Your help, Christian, may go further than you expect. Haven't you discovered that often enough? You take something to the Lord, and maybe you have an idea of how the Lord's going to help you. And he helps you in a completely different way, and he does more than you expected. And sometimes you're left kind of open-mouthed.
You know, we worry about things, don't we? Sometimes the Lord goes ahead of us and scatters them before we even reach them. And that's what happens here with the Philistine. The Lord goes ahead and scatters them. You'll hear a sound going, an indication that the Lord and his angels and his army were going ahead of David. And he still does that by his spirit, going ahead. David is a servant king. David is a successful king. But thirdly, David is not a perfect king. He's not a perfect king. It was usual for kings in those days to take many wives. David had at least eight. It was the world's way, but it was not God's way. It was absolutely forbidden. Verse 13, And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem. I'm not going to go into it tonight but it led to sorrow and pain on a grand scale. Even David is a disappointment at times. Even David mars the kingdom. David is not the perfect king. But there is a perfect king. And again to quote D.R. Davis, the kingdom is only safe in the hands of David's descendant who always does what pleases the Father. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Eternal Lord, we praise thy name that the kingdom of Christ is safe in Christ's hand. The king who always does what is right. Oh, he is our servant king. May we adore him and learn from him. He is our successful king. May we come in gratitude and lean more upon him and less upon ourselves. And he is our perfect king who has but one bride and who gave himself for her. In his obedience to the Father, we find the ground of our hope and our righteousness. Go before us into the night. Take us home safely, pardoning sin for Jesus' sake. Amen. Psalm 68. And at 17. God's chariots 20,000 are, thousands of angels strong in his holy place. God is as in Mount Sinai, them among, down to twenty, God's chariots. God's chariots, twenty thousand, thousands of angels strong, and so
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.